everyone. Welcome in. Body Movement Podcast. Here we are with my host, my co-host, younger sister, Dr. Allison Sinkowski. Join us today, special guest, DDS, dentist, Michael Hutchinson, out in uh, the Midwest, Michigan, I believe, correct? Yeah, Northern Michigan. Northern Michigan. Uh, really excited to talk to today. Um, kind of checks all the boxes of things we've been talking about the past, you know, 15, 20 episodes here. We got a little bit of entrepreneurship. So kind of just taking uh, control of your own life. We got youth sports, injuries, and then a unique niche, which is something we're trying to do with like primal movements is the theme of our podcast and getting people to move their bodies the way they're supposed to move. And the, ne- the niche with uh, Dr. Hutchinson here is concussions. Um, I don't want to call it, you know, you're going to educate us, but, uh, you know, dental health with sports and protecting your mouth with, uh, the invention and a new product, well, new wish product to the mainstream market. Um, the power plus mouth mouth guard. So CEO and founder of that, along with his standard dentist practice, he's been doing for oh God, 20, 30 years, it looks like based on our conversations in the past. So, uh, welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you and talk to you here about uh, everything you've been doing with the youth sports and pro sports movement for that matter. Thank you. It's good to meet with you. And uh, anytime I have a chance to talk about you know, innovations in dentistry and yeah. uh, all of our lives, it's uh, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's um, it's a good launching off point there. Like, you know, I, I, w- I was talking to you over email before we got going and you know, people think uh, sports and sports training and, you know, dentistry doesn't come up a lot. You know, it's personal trainers, it's strength and conditioning, it, you know, it's physical therapists, you, you know, surgeries in the medical world, you know, dental might come up during your hockey fights, during your boxing, maybe football, if somebody chips a tooth, but nobody, nobody thinks about sports performance, injury prevention, mainstream when, uh, when dentistry is mentioned, but, uh, it probably is in there more than we think and more just around, you know, break, breaking chip in your tooth and, and actual health of your teeth. So um, areas where you've found that people are like, Oh God, I had no idea dentists were involved in sports to that level. And even on the performance side, um, you know, where are those common myths that you've kind of had to debunk over the years, especially the way you've gotten involved, but, overall or where, where dentist kind of fits in, in sports performance because it's a it's a rare thing to hear about well there's an association for uh, the academy of sports dentistry which is dedicated to you know of course oral injuries sure um mainly mouth guards which is uh one thing they promote a lot yeah uh, the change is the type of mouth guard that's the that's the real change and Something that really uh, we should point out is that, because it's a good thing you brought up, uh, for so long, we have physicians and we have dentists and we have chiropractors, we have podiatrists and we have physical therapists. And uh, in the minds of our patients, sometimes they they feel like, you know, the mouth is out of the out of the body you know it's it's not part of the body and has nothing to do with the rest of the body right we all know that uh, the body is all together you're talking allison's language already (laughs) (laughs) and you know that's the thing that we really have to get around because you can you can change somebody's bite and it will make them stand differently and uh it's it's a lot of factors but uh in just one if, if you're if your airway gets closed, your, your brain says, I need more oxygen and makes you stand differently. Hold your head, tip your neck, push your jaw out, lean backwards. Yeah. And when you're out of balance, that means you start hurting in those places. Right. And if you don't consider how the bite is, uh, you're just not going to rectify that situation. Uh, and vice versa. You can, you can throw out your knee and have a, a Uh, a misaligned knee and that will cause your jaw to be misplaced and these things are not widely uh, recognized by most practitioners and this is where uh, this whole concept that I got into with the physiologic jaw positioning mouth guard comes from treating TMJ or temporal mandibular joint patients right 
Yeah, that's um, it's a good launching off point because that's something Allison continuously corrects me on. You know, I have a good resource in my sister being a PT. So anytime something's bothering me or we're evaluating my movement, but you know, my knee hurts, my shoulder hurts, and she keeps telling me we got to focus on my feet and my toes. You know, because it's all connected. Um, so that that is something that you, even with her knowledge and our discussing on the podcast I, still the teeth and the jaw never comes into my mind so um you you must you must be constantly educating as an entry point to people that don't give this much thought and r- making them realize how important it is well that's the thing about uh, this whole concept is especially when it comes to TMJ, and I know Allison probably fairly familiar with it. Um, TMJ is very elusive in practice today. I don't do the conventional TMJ therapy because uh, when I was sitting in dental school, it just seemed so ridiculous and arbitrary that we would, uh, that I'm supposed to be a, a doctor and I'm supposed to tell patients that I don't know how to really rectify the situation and we're just gonna put a splint in your mouth and if it if it works it works and if it doesn't it doesn't and there's nothing else i can do yeah i can't stand that so right um i started studying neuromuscular dentistry which has a, a, a devotion to muscle function physiology neurology and once i started doing that i i knew that uh, i could actually cure TMJ by putting the jaw in its physiologic jaw position. I could increase nerve function, increase muscle function, and I could actually stop uh, the headaches and migraines and, and uh, neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain that's generated from a misaligned jaw uh, by putting the jaw in that position. Um, And this is a life changing thing for people because Today, there's thousands of people going to their physician with a migraine and uh, they know nothing about how the teeth should fit together and frankly, are, don't care because they don't even know. Right. And uh, the resolution never comes because if you treat something with this uh, medication, you're not getting to the source of the problem. And Common theme here. Yep. If, you don't get, if you don't get to the source of the problem, you're just not going to fix it. Right. So right. Uh, this is where Power Plus Mouth Guard came from because I've been treating those patients with a different approach. And again, I, we call it neuromuscular dentistry. And we find out where that physiologic rest position is for the jaw. And that aligns everything up and... Uh, stops the, the lactic acid buildup, it stops the muscle spasms, it stops the the uh, torquing of the muscles to yeah. try to put your teeth together that aren't in the right spot and all the headaches go away. And there is a, a definite component to those uh, chronic pain patients that comes from the jaw and if it's not recognized, it will not resolve. Right. Al, do you uh, do you see this a lot? Uh, I'm just curious. Well, I, I, a few things. One, um, I laugh. I'm laughing because I a lot of people will call and say, you know, do you specialize in TMJ as a PT? And anytime, you know, whether my administrator gets them on the phone, I want to talk to them because I talk to them first about like what I need to know more, right? Like it doesn't. It's not just TMJ. There's so much more. And agreed. Like sometimes it's just simple. Like from my end, it's not. Um, maybe they have been to their dentist, a lot of dentists, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, kind of poo poo it or don't know what to do with it. So people are just living with it. And then, you know, if we get back and we start kind of, like you said, from the bottom up and work from the, um, you know, from not from the jaw per se, a lot of times I don't even touch people for jaw pain. Like I'll do, you know, back work or, you know, same thing, like change their alignment, just ask them like, okay, if you're up like this, does that change what you feel when you open and close your mouth? And if they're like, yes, I'm like, okay, then that's not a true disky TMJ issue. That's more about where your body's positioned. Um, and to have that conversation with a dentist is actually quite challenging. Um, I think, I don't know if you, like how much oh, contact like, you have to PTs, but um, 
So I see, I, I see that a lot. And I see people, I think, you know, you were talking about breathing and head position, you know, so a lot of times with neck, your headaches, like we'll talk about breathing first and, and say, yeah. can you even expand to get breath in? And if you can't, then that's going to change everything from the top too. Right. Um, so I see them and certainly from my light, you know, I see them in a, in a different way, but um, certainly when I've had times that I've wanted to have a discussion with the dentist, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's, I'd be interested in your response there, Michael, because one, another theme I hear that we're always challenging, Allison's always challenging other PTs that are just like not keeping up with cutting edge, or they're just treating the symptom, not a root cause. So not only educating the public with your new product, which I, we want to learn all about, but like, are you seeing that a challenge within your own industry? Like dentistry is, and the healthcare system is this bigger animal we've been tackling here. Like it's not focused in the right way or the education isn't there within the industry or their ability to get the message out, some of all the above, do you see any and all of that? Yeah, and I mean, dentistry is like any other profession. There's, of course. There's an art to it, which is uh, creative, where you, know, you look at a situation and you use your cre creativity to solve the problem. Uh, there's other, there's the science, uh, medical aspect to that as to how the body functions and the body usually functions in only one way. There's, there's not like different mechanisms that can get the same, the same accomplishment. You know, your heart beats in a certain way. And if you try another way, it's probably not going to beat, right? Because that's the way it works. Right. So, um, you find in dentistry, there's a, the, the art part gets in the way. And so it, there's these schools of thought. The one that, that uh, is most popular has been around for 200 years. And that should tell you right now that uh, that can't be right because yeah. 200 years ago, right. uh, you know, they thought the world was still flat, you know, so... <laughs> I use there's I a handful use, of those people still out there now, but whatever. I have this Carry question I get asked all the time by naturally we're uh, I guess humans are skeptic of things, you know, and but we always ask these questions that are really kind of not not really that smart, <laughs> but we think they are like, right. Yep. Uh, if this is such a great idea, how come all the uh, Leading authorities haven't, you know, well, because the leading authorities don't know, right? right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, in 1633, the Pope, who's the leading authority of the world back then, <laughs> put Galileo on house arrest for heresy yep. because he said the earth went around the sun. Yep. And he right. told him not to uh, teach that anymore or he'd be stuck in jail. <laughs> and Galileo died in jail because he was right. <laughs> right. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. Human so, condition. No doubt. That's the thing with that, yeah, you're going to find with dentists that, especially when it comes to TMJ, because first of all, we don't really know how to mm -hmm. cure it. They don't yeah. teach us. And TMJ is one of those elusive things that gets thrown in our lap. And then we throw it into the orthodontist lap and they don't really understand it. And right. so uh, the physicians, they don't, that's a dentist thing. So they don't, really want to know about it yeah uh because their their method of migraine treatment is medication you know give you a prescription for imitrex or go yep. home and take it when you start having a headache right yep yeah so, I mean, a lot of parallels to back pain we've been talking about for several episodes too just like and, prescribe and, and, and don't treat and don't investigate further and don't test new ideas in dentistry that. tmj is a uh, really complicated because in order to fix it you you have to change the anatomy you don't it's not surgical but it's how the teeth fit together and right. there's six planes of occlusion forward backward tip roll pitch yaw and those teeth have to fit perfectly in all those positions or else the muscles get out of alignment and they start radiating pain and so then the argument really comes, well, how do you fit those teeth together? 
And most of us are only taught by using a little splint, we call it. And uh, we, we just think that if we put it in there, you can grind on the plastic and, and uh, everything will be okay. You won't ruin your teeth. But it doesn't, that's, it's not that easy because you, your teeth are held together in your jawbone by muscles. There's 138 muscles from your shoulders to the top of your head. And each one of those makes a contraction or a relaxation depending upon another muscle that contracts or relaxes. Yep. And so if, they're, if that structure is not right, those muscles are gonna suffer. And so that's the problem with TMJ. And it, and it goes out into what we're talking about with the mouth guard is that if those muscles aren't functioning in their proper direction or vector, yeah. And your teeth aren't in the right place, you're going to put your jaw in the wrong position and that's going to translate G forces to your brain. Yeah. And that's going to also, uh, before I learned anything about concussions is uh, that's going to disrupt uh, nerve function to your muscles and you're not going to be able to output uh, your 100% muscle function. So you're going to be weaker in your whole body if your jaw doesn't fit the way it should by that cascading uh, neurology that uh, uh, we're just now learning to understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great segue into then like the power. So, you know, TMJ being obviously one thing you, you've seen, but what led you to, I don't know, one, take a, to a passion to you sports that you've kind of been pushing your product on and, and get into your product studying the history, which I've gone through your website, studying the history of the mouth guard um, and why it was developed and the misperceptions of that, which I would love to discuss. But to get into your product, I'll, I'll start with the punchline for everyone and then we can lead backwards. But your, your product is a mouth guard that goes on the bottom set of the teeth. Um, from our conversations, I believe you, you, you recommend this for people that do box, play football, basketball and soccer. Um, which is a unique concept for people to hear. Um, so one, what kind of led you to this, you know, not discover, but to investigate the cause of concussions, the use of the mouth guard. Um, and then, you know, where your research kind of led you to today, where you are. All right. Well, this is, uh, this is my 21st year. So the story it's can get kind of long, but I'll try to consolidate it by yeah. saying that um, my dad was an exercise physiologist and he became one back in 1970 when there weren't very many uh, and he was very renowned in his field and we were very uh, into sports I played uh, football tennis basketball I wore mouth guards like anybody else um, I hated them like anybody else because you can't breathe, you can't talk, uh, they're uncomfortable. And so um, that I'm sure led to a little bit of, of the generation of what I was trying to do. And mainly it came from this whole concept of TMJ that we were talking about. Um, I, I, I wasn't satisfied with what I was taught and uh, I just didn't want to be a person who said, sorry, Mrs. Jones, I can't help you. You know, um, I don't like that. I like to know what I'm doing and I like to help people get better. And so um, I investigated, I just happened to, um, first of all, I'm accredited in the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Back when I did that, there were only 125 in the world. And in order to make sure that my restorations my smiles that I did for people, makeovers and such, didn't break off. I wanted to make sure that I handled their TMJ situation correctly so they wouldn't break my beautiful smile that I just did. Um, you know, it was a lot of work and it cost a lot of money to do it. So I wanted to protect it. Right. And uh, I just happened to run across a guy who'd been doing a TMJ therapy that was outside the box. Um, he'd been doing it for 30 years. His name was Jim Carlson, a mentor of mine. And uh, I called him up and I said, I want you to tell me what you're doing. And he went through it and it was just so right. It just made so much sense to me that I 
spent some time with him and uh, learned his te his technique. I came back. I had five really severe TMJ patients that uh, my physical therapists, my chiropractors that I work with, and myself could not uh, find resolution. Yeah. They've been to many other doctors, many other dentists, and of course, nobody could find out what was wrong. Yeah. And I came back from this uh, time I spent with Dr. Carlson. I called them up. There were five of them. And I said, now I can fix you. And I did. Every single one of them wow. uh, resolved their pain because they had a bite problem that was not corrected and that I had not corrected. And so right. um, by doing this, I began to really see a lot of TMJ patients uh, because now I could cure them. I knew how to do that. And the feedback that I was getting was that they would say, you know, I have, I don't feel like I need to take a nap anymore in the afternoon. I feel like I got more energy and uh, I have these boxes for, for my Christmas decorations that are heavy and I couldn't lift them, but now I can lift them. What's all that all about doc. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I said, well, as far as I can tell, the uh, research is shown in a rudimentary way. There wasn't really a lot of uh, instrumentation to kind of quantify it, but yeah, uh, you can get about 25% increase in strength by just correcting your bite uh, back to its physiologic rest position. And right. so uh, that started me to investigate, you know, what's this all about? And I found some articles. Um, one of them was done in Notre Dame in, in 1983, where they reported that they did something called a mora. Uh, back then it was real arbitrary, but they called it a mandibular repositioning appliance. Um, and there was some uh, talk about some Russian weightlifters, you know, back in the 80s, the, ri the Russians could not be beat. And they were talking about they had a mouth guard and they call it a mora. It just never went anywhere. And yeah. uh, this Notre Dame study showed uh, three interesting things. One was increase in strength. Two was more stamina. And three was a lower incidence of knee injuries, which I thought was fascinating because at the point I was at at that time, I didn't know what your mouth had to do with your knees, <laughs> right? Right. right. Uh, but it uh, got me to, you know, really like, you know, because of my background with my dad, we, we had tickets to every Iowa State sporting event yep. and we went. And I thought to myself, if I could make Mrs. Jones stronger, what would happen if I took the uh, linemen from the uh, Detroit Lions, who are 0-9, and, <laughs> and they started kicking annually, butt annually the Super Bowl, right? I'd be a genius, right? Right, right. <laughs> So I started to figure out, and I talked to Carlson, and I said, hey, what about making a mouth guard in this physiologic job position? He goes, yeah, absolutely. My brother was an uh, assistant coach at Washington when they won two Rose Bowls. And I made the guys mouth guards and they ended up in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. And he goes, absolutely. Uh, increased strength, about 25%. And so um, just so happened one day, a guy that was, I call him a local celebrity up here in this small town. He was the police chief. He was the fire chief. <laughs> His name was Ralph Soffrandini. And he had gotten in as a hobby to power lifting he was a bench presser and he made it on the USA team. He was over 65 years old and he was in that category. He won a national championship wow. uh, bench pressing. He lifted 398 pounds. And so out of faith, I cold called him. I called him up on the phone and uh, I didn't have any proof, but I just knew that this was a true principle. And I said to him, because uh, his article said that he was going to go to Prague and represent the United States and the world record was 435 and he, won he was working really hard to break it. Right. Jesus. So yeah. I told him I can get your world record tonight. And he was like really like interested and intrigued. And I told him about it. And he came over and I made him a mouth guard 
long story short, he lifted 455 pounds that night and he was so excited and uh, he went on to Prague and broke the world record. He had worked up to 525 pounds. So let me stop you there. So this dude could lift 398. That was his max. That was his absolute max. In a competition, he lifted 398. He came over, you put this mouth guard on him, and that night he lifted 50 pounds more? Yeah. Jesus but he, he could have done more. I told him it's about 25%, so that'll put you about 480. He got to 455 and he'd never been there and he got scared and didn't want to hurt himself. So. <laughs> right. But he had six weeks. So during that six weeks, he uh, went up to 525. I got his workout logs, his weightlifting logs, because I wanted to have that data. Yeah. And then he went and broke the world record and held it for 10 years. So I knew that there was uh, validity to this mechanism which yeah. I didn't really understand that much yeah. at, the, at that time that uh, every person has a physiologic job position and every person can increase their strength output. They don't, you don't go out and receive strength into your body. It's in there already. You're just not the muscle synapse between the nerve and the nerve ending and the muscle fiber are not being told to do anything it's just laying there doing nothing 25 percent of them on the average yeah so uh, so i come to find out that uh you know it just depends on the person i say 25 percent uh wayne state university's biomedical engineering department caught wind of what i was doing and called me and said can we can we test your mouth guard and they did and actually wrote a paper uh, on it and presented it internationally as a new discovery. And yeah. they reported a 16.8% increase in strength by using physiologic job position. So that's what I holding everything else constant and just changing that one. Yeah. Better. You just yeah. change your job. And so can uh, you, can you explain like, so if you were to explain this to a layman, if you're explaining this to somebody who has no medical background, Mm -hmm. How do you explain the process it works? And then somebody who has a medical background, how do you explain that it, how, the mechanism in which it works? Well, uh, there's a couple of things that we found out. And one is it opens your airway so you get more oxygen and uh, changes your cortisol level. But uh, the main thing is you got a, a hub of transmission of nerve information that has to pass through this part from your brain. And if you're, if, if there's a, a uh, entrapment of a muscle where a nerve is pinched, some of the fibers are not allowed to transmit the energy to the muscle. The fiber doesn't get that information to contract. It just gets no information. So you, if you're 15% deficient in strength, 15 muscle fibers out of a hundred are not contracting. They're just laying there doing nothing. So what I usually do to, to for athletes is I actually do a, uh, a demonstration. And at first I was using techniques with kinesiology where I would just, you know, have them clench their teeth and I'd push on their arms and uh, show them and they would, but I, I learned very quickly that people were skeptical and they thought I was cheating somehow. So yeah. I had to develop a instrument to do that. And I found a, a digital weighing device that could register uh, resistance. And then I would use that where I'd have them do a curl and then I'd put their jaw in the physiologic jaw position. And then uh, I'd have them do another curl and then you'd see an increase in strength. Wayne State used a, uh, a flexion and extension apparatus where they could measure strength output uh, with arms and legs. And that's where they got their data. So when I, when I talk to moms and dads, uh, I usually just kind of dumb it down a little bit so that they can understand that, you know, we've got your brain telling your body to contract your, you know, to jump, to, you know, to jump, but there's some uh, muscles that are pinching off nerves that won't let you uh, 
uh, get as much information as you need so you can't jump as high until you uh, put your jaw in its passive position where the muscles are quiet, they don't entrap those nerves and they allow that information to go through, then you get increased uh, output. So um, this is how I, I try to explain it to a layman person. And, they, mm -hmm. and if, I, if I can, I'll do a demonstration. If I have you, a big, um, large group. Has the, re the research like yourself or in, in other places like I mean, they compared it to just a mouth guard in or had, you know, had a comparison and, um, and then obviously how you're measuring the strength Like you said you had that device or are you, you know, yeah. you're testing against a bio Wednesday. deck, like what's the comparisons and um, what's the that, blinding in the studies? That's what, right, that's what Wayne State did. Wayne State used my mouth guard. They used Shock Doctor, which is the number one mouth guard out there on the market. That's what everybody seems to use. Then if you order equipment from Rawlings or some sporting good company, they'll give you a free one. It's like a real cheapy, you know, $1 mouth guard you've probably seen before. And no mouth guard. That's how they did their study. Um, and I can send that to you if you'd like. Yeah, I'd love that. And the yeah. interesting, interesting thing is, and it's, I love it because it is, uh, it really shows more than just who won the competition. It shows why, if you, if you understand what the physiologic job position, it shows why shock doctor had the worst results because it's all about jaw position and a lot of it's vertical dimension. In other words, how your teeth uh, fit together in a vertical direction. Shock Doctor is a mouth guard that one size fits every person. In other words, they just print them out on an injection mold and uh, you buy it, you heat it up and you bite into it, which is another uh, flaw because you don't want to know where you bite. You want to know where you're muscles contract involuntarily that's what you want to do because that's your physiologic job position so you can bite in an infinite number of positions forward backward side to side you're not enough too much uh, that's not what you want there's a there's a particular zone of, of vertical dimension where your physiologic job position is so that's why a shock doctor ended up being the worst because you have all these people that are different and you have the same mouth guard. So uh, they were all, most of them in the bell curve were all weak because they didn't, they didn't need what shock doctor gave them or they needed more or it was too much. There's three strikes against them. So um, this is the important thing about totally about mouth guards. The other thing is that all mouth guards, including shock doctor, go on the upper arch, which is not a, a movable part of the skull. So you can't get physiologic jaw position from a, a stationary part of the skull. Uh, so it, it just blocks what your jaw can do and what your nerve, uh, your, your autonomic nervous system is trying to do for you uh, because it's just in the way. So, um, that's kind of how, in a nutshell, how it, how a physiologic job position is obtained. So, so I, I, have uh, a, I have a quick question. Go ahead. It might not be quick, but so <laughs> my, um, my head is going. So when, when in our lives did we start to have a modification in jaw position you know, what about, you know, 50, 200 years ago, when, you know, is it like, is this almost like performance enhancement that we're finding this or is because just like in, you know, in regular life, everybody has their, their own position, which is, I think a part of this for you is like, it's a, it's customized, you know, to the individual. Um, yeah. But it what like, what, what makes somebody not be in physiological job position? Well, what we, what we found, uh, there's a guy named Casey Gousset, who's a, a monumental in, in the discovery of physiologic job position. And he did a, a research that I think is 
just uh, key to this whole thing, and that he took a hundred thousand uh, Eskimo skulls from the Smithsonian Institute, and he measured what well, he was looking for a perfect bite. Um, and this it's for another show for me to describe all this, but. <laughs> Because uh, in dentistry, that's what we want to know. We want to know what the perfect bite is. And we want to know where the axis of rotation, uh, because that makes a, a difference as to how you shape the teeth. And if, if the teeth are too sharp or too tall or too flat or too wide, or, we want to know uh, how to build those teeth. And, we, and, that, and the axis of rotation of your jaw was always thought would be like driving a nail through your your condyle and your your jaw hinges but that's not how the jaw works and casey gousset showed that the axis of rotation is actually c1 uh it, when you when you put it on a graph but anyway i'm getting off the subject but um so what we what we learned was that um there is a a perfect bite uh, and the vertical dimension from the uh, cemento enamel junction on your tooth where the enamel comes to the root, that's called a cemento enamel junction. And right there, the gum line is right there too. So if you measure gum to gum, that should be 19 millimeters plus or minus two. And he took these Eskimo skulls, uh, a culture and a, a race that didn't intermingle, ate the same thing. There was no factors that caused their genetic change. And uh, he determined that that 19 millimeters was the perfect bite. And you can take that, that measurement and you can extrapolate it over to us and put us at 19 millimeters and we will get balanced. We will uh, eliminate our pain and everything will function uh, the way it should. So to answer your question is, uh, I think the, the biggest theory that, that we're working on is genetic potential. So we come along to the early 1900s and we start doing things to ourselves that uh, disrupt our genetic code and our genetic potential, like eating processed foods and uh, mixing with Europeans and all these people and we mix all our genes up, right? And so our mouths or jaw structure don't reach that genetic potential and therefore the muscles and the skeleton don't fit together perfectly. And then we have this, it develops into this disruption. Um, but if you take native cultures that don't mix and don't eat processed foods, they don't, typically have the TMJ pain and headaches and things like that. That's not a part of their, their problems. Um, so mm -hmm. this is, this is the uh, concept that, that's being really explored right now is that we in the United States and most modern cultures have messed up our genetic potential. And therefore we, we didn't develop exactly the way our genes said we should, we missed the mark by, a certain percentage and that that uh extrapolates down to all that we do but for my purposes um it makes a disruption in your uh neurology to your muscles and causes uh number one a weakness in your body's performance but also we haven't touched on concussions yet and that's a whole uh, whole other ball game that i that just kind of fell out of the sky as i was uh, looking at strength because really I go back to what I was saying that if I could take the lions front line and make them all 25% stronger, they would, they would uh, beat everybody down the field to the goal line. Right. Yeah. But when I was testing these things uh, I needed data because nobody was uh, believing what I was doing. And so I started with my son's eighth grade football team and there's an orthodontist in town whose sons were on a Catholic football team. And there was a hundred boys that I could test. And so I tested them all for strength. They were about 25% increase in strength as a team. There were some that are only 5% increase, but they had a really perfect bite. 
uh, other kids were all messed up and they were up around 50, 60% uh, increase in strength because their, their bites were telescopic. They were super overclosed. Uh, Allison, if you, if somebody comes in and wants, it says they got TMJ or they got migraines and they've seen all kinds of people. If you take out a millimeter ruler, have them bite their teeth together. And if you can't see the lower teeth, number one, those people have a bite that is causing this muscle function and whatever you do, you'll never resolve it until they get their bite up there. Um, so that's an easy thing to do, but the hard thing is to go to the, to find a dentist who's going to listen to you in that regard. That's the hard part for you. But uh, so I was taking these boys and for six years, I followed them in their seasons and uh, the Catholic school won five state championships back to back. And uh, my son's eighth grade team was undefeated. His uh, ninth grade team was undefeated. His sophomore team was undefeated. But more than anything else than that, no, none of these boys had a concussion. And they didn't have any concussions on that team for six years until they were all out of high school. My son played Pop Warner football, and I made his mouth guards, of course. He never had, he's never had a concussion. He played linebacker and fullback. Um, and he also wrestled. I was a uh, state qualifier in wrestling. But uh, when, when I got that result from those 100 boys, uh, concussions was a, starting to become a really big thing. Uh, a couple of people, Junior Seau and uh, Dave Dewerson, both committed suicide so they could donate their brains because they felt like there's something wrong. And uh, that was right about 2010. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've spent most of the time promoting the, uh, the change in, in concussion treatment or uh, uh, concussion, uh, you know, resolving because of uh, it, it's just so important. But, you know, I'd already I'd already kind of proved that there was strength increase. And Wayne State did that. Uh, and concussions seem to be the most important thing at the time. And I, I believe it still is. I mean, yeah. I've had so many different uh, stories I can tell you, like the weightlifter uh, that I just told you about. I've had people run faster, jump higher. So uh, it's, a, it's an appliance that every sport should incorporate, not necessarily, not only contact sports, but... Uh, Believe it or not, cheerleading has a high incidence of concussions, and they don't wear mouth guards. And I bet you, if you if you went to a team and said you should wear a mouth guard, they'd laugh at you and say, "Well, how can I cheer with a mouth guard in my mouth?" Well, you do it with one in the lower teeth. That's how you do it. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And actually, um, we haven't had one team in uh, East Central Oklahoma. In Ada, Oklahoma, East Central University, at the cheerleading team had has Power Plus. Very nice. Um, all right, so yeah, I think we're getting towards the end. So we haven't talked too too much about concussions. So um, and just and just your passion for you you sports because that seems to be like just following you on social. You're you're kind of always just pushing us, just coaches to be better and protecting protecting the youth. So. Um, if you want to just like real brief, kind of mention some of the concussion studies that you've been a part of that supports your product. Um, and then just kind of like the state of youth sports and how, you know, how you fit into that landscape, whether it be the mouth guard itself, or just like, you know, just being better, uh, coaches in, in the, in the state of youth sport, better coaches, better teachers, better leaders. And, um, you know, how all, all this kind of fits together, but, um, we can start with the concussion piece that you've, it sounds like you just kind of stumbled on that with your, with your, uh, with your mouth guard. Well, it, the kids are a really big part of what really inspired me to do this. Like I said, my son, I, my son played pop Warner. I was one of the coaches that starts in fifth grade. And, uh, you know, we, uh, he was in sport. He was in football from fifth grade to senior year, and uh, 
decided he wanted to be a doctor. Uh, he's a, now he's in a urology residency, but he was invited to play on a national uh, championship uh, BYU rugby team, but he decided he didn't want to get beat up for nothing. You know, he wanted to be a doctor. So, <laughs> right. uh, but that's the that's the reason why I uh, developed this mouth guard that you can buy online because my thought was, you know. I just know that kids are getting concussions and there's no, there's, there's no device out there that, that stops concussions. They've had helmets forever. The concussion yeah. rates have been 20% uh, reported and unreported for the last 50 years. It's not changed and they've been trying to do everything they can. Yeah. And it never, doesn't change. And uh, so I'm looking at you now because the mouth and the jaw is the 20%. And I proved that with uh, a long-term study. Uh, what I did was I thought, well, uh, I went to Wayne State and I said, uh, I need an acceleration study because the army tells me that if I can lower the acceleration or G-force, that they'll put it on the army and they'll put it in the military because that's how that they study concussions. And what that means is they, uh, take a surrogate, a crash dummy, a cadaver head, and they put it in a pendulum. So they basically put a sensors on it and uh, take a, a bowling ball and smash it. But that's not a really that's not a real person. Right. And so I did do this acceleration study with Power Plus on a, on their surrogate and showed in three of the four blows that it lowered the sensors but i thought that was ridiculous that we were <laughs> we were taking a, a non-person an artist rendition of what a, a person is and had no resemblance to a person yeah uh, and we were making decisions on uh what we should do for people based on a, a crash dummy <laughs> yeah. so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to get people to wear my mouth guard. They have to wear one anyway. And the only difference to them is that it's going to be on the bottom instead of on the top. I get this question so many times and, and I say it's a dumb question with love in my heart, but it's a really dumb question. As people ask me, well, if this goes on the bottom, what's protecting the upper teeth? My and question. I say, if it goes on the top, what's protecting the lower teeth? Right. Because that's not what it's for. It never was designed to protect your teeth or uh, it was designed to keep you from banging your teeth together, which causes fractures. But it, it will not, and mine will not, keep you from knocking your teeth out if there's enough force. Um, it'll, it'll cut your lip no matter if it's upper or lower uh yeah so the only thing that protects that is uh maybe a full upper and lower mouth guard would protect you from lacerations but you still have contusions you can still so it really doesn't do that it really doesn't do a, a conventional mouth guard really doesn't do very much what people think it does right uh, or what it should do i, was, I mean uh, the first time we talked that's I didn't understand, you know, I've never done a real full contact sports except, you know, except way back in the day football, but, um, I always thought it was to protect my tooth from getting shit. And that it about. will do. And, uh, mine will do that too, because there's a piece of plastic between the two teeth. So, uh, when it gets banged together, it cushions that, yeah. but, uh, I proved that a mouth guard can do even more than that for you can increase your performance and your strength can make you run faster, jump higher, hit the ball farther. And when you get hit in the head, it's going to position your condyle, the ball of the jaw into the eminence or the socket in a midpoint position so that when there's a G force that comes up your jaw or to the side, it can't jump across that gap. It's too, it's too far. So it has to go out into your body and be dissipated 
and it lowers the g-forces which I, I showed on the surrogate dummy but that's how we ended up with a 0.2 percent concussion rate out of 7,000 athletes we've studied that's nine concussions so you get hit hard enough you're going to get a concussion with power plus but you have to get hit really hard because uh, in most of the concussive forces and we still are studying it but this is what I did I said okay you have to wear a mouth guard anyway so wear this one and let's see what happens because the concussion rate is uh, most teams most football teams is about six a year uh, sometimes 16 so uh, just I'll say I'll tell you one one uh, situation that happened that was uh, monumental is that uh, a team out in California the high school was Corona Santiago. They had 180 players on their team and they uh, wanted to, they didn't want to buy uh, one for everybody. They just wanted to put them on half of the team. Probably their, their most uh, important, the best players. <laughs> right. If I was a parent on the other side, I'd have been really ticked off that they chose my kid to get a concussion. But what happened was 90, the 90 kids who had, uh, physiologic job position there were zero concussions and on the 90 that had their own mouth guard there were 16 so that was a a, a, a great study in fact um, my son in his medical school proposed this data to his neurology professor and they both wrote a paper and uh, published it about this result of physiologic job position. And so uh, this, is, this is so important because I know there's so many kids out there today that are getting concussions and there's no answer. There's no answer except for, we need to get the legislature to ban, ban the sport. Uh, and or they, change the rules, you know. Extra, right, I mean, know. California tried to ban it until high school. Well. They just took out a million kids from getting a, a college scholarship or making their life better. Uh, right. And it's not necessary because we haven't put every possible uh, safeguard in yet. We, we've totally ignored the jaw. We, we've actually made it worse. We give them these mouth guards that are too thick. We, we, we make popular the style. So uh, the most popular one is a, is a, you know, a pacifier, which could, couldn't be the worst mouth guard you could possibly wear. But yet this is the most popular one. We take a, a chin strap to hold our helmet on and we tighten it up. So we push our, our joint back and touch uh, the skull. And then we go out there and we, we say we're safe and we hit as hard as we can. And, and uh, yeah. then we wonder why we get a uh, concussion. Yeah. The poster child I have is Daniel Sorensen for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's warm, he was my brother's, his wife was my brother's kid's babysitter. And when he graduated from BYU, he got invited as a practice player. He didn't get a contract or anything to the Kansas City Chiefs. And he, uh, my brother gave him power plus that was eight years ago. Now, now he's a uh, starting free safety. He's been in two Super Bowls. Yep. He hasn't had a concussion. Yep. And he went from practice player to a starting uh, $16 million player. And this past year, he's the one that put them in the Super Bowl against the Browns when the guy was going for the end zone and Daniel comes across and hit him in the head, <laughs> head to head hit. Yeah. He, the guy fumbled the ball out of the end zone. So it was no touchdown. Right. They hung on to win. Daniel was the guy who did that. Right. He jumped up and kept playing. No concussion. The other yeah. guy was like, ow. Right. Right. You know, um, very cool. So yeah, we're, we're wrapping up. If, if I'd be interested, you know, you've been around, you've been, you've been producing this uh, product for 15, 20 years now. Um, 
and we were just talking like some of the difficulty in getting getting the message out, right? You said this is such a differentiator in the market. You have some studies, by the way, share those studies with us. We can put them to the link in our YouTube comments so people can see them um, along with your website. So just so people can see it. But um, I don't know, what, like, what, do you, what do you think the slow trickle has been? Like you, you, you said you've got some NBA players now testing them out. You got your, your player with the Chiefs, a couple of people with the Chargers you've mentioned. Um, what, from an entrepreneur standpoint, you know, getting the patents, maybe getting it to market, finding those influencer channels just to get your message out. That's something we're trying to figure out too with the podcast. Like, what, you know, what do you see as some of the hurdles? Is it more perception of a product and there's vested interest? Is it more, you know, you just got to do better with social? Like what, from a businessman standpoint, what have you been kind of learning the past 15, 20 years? Uh, I think there, there's probably three really difficult hurdles. Um, and I know that my, my situation is a unique one uh, than maybe somebody who comes up with a better broom or something like that. Right. Um, first of all, you have all these leading authorities, you know, and there's politics, egos, uh, people who are on a pedestal that don't want to be knocked off a pedestal and they're a leading authority. So they, yeah, they utilize their influence. So for example, you go to the Cowboys, you know, their team doctor feels threatened when I come around uh, team dentist because he doesn't know about it. And of course he thinks I'm going to take his job, which I'm not. Uh, and he doesn't want them to ask why he hasn't come up with the idea or why haven't we known about this or, you know, yeah. um, and that's sad to me because the guy, the kid out there playing is still getting the concussion right. because we're arguing about who thought of the idea. So that that's really, uh, been a big hurdle that I've been, you know, uh, faced up against for a long time is that just trying to get to talk to the right people and get them to think a little bit differently. Um, that's, that's a main hurdle that, that I've just had to persist at because yep. now 20 years later, there's just no answer. And so people are tired of, having their kids get hurt and then nobody has an answer for it. So they start to listen up. Sure. Uh, another huge barrier is money. And this one is so frustrating to me because um, <laughs> there's all of these coaches associations and they have speakers. And I am so willing to speak at these, but I can't, they won't let me speak unless I pay them $10,000. If I pay them $10,000, then they'll listen to everything I say. So yeah. that the money makes the credibility sort of, and that that's so frustrating because in order to you can't, to talk to one person at a time, it, you know, you never get anywhere. So you talk to groups and you can move things forward. But yeah, okay. everything's all about money. And when you go to you know the players like Daniel, uh, fortunately his wife was my brother's babysitter right. otherwise he wouldn't have listened to me either yeah uh all of the athletes are geared towards money now and they they won't social media uh anything unless you pay them up front yep uh a yep. big amount of money and it's a catch-22 because they get their money and then they're not going to say anything. i mean they'll say a couple of things but what are you going to do they got their money so you can say yeah. hey well you need to keep posting more <laughs> and uh, i'm tired of it Right. They're all about, uh, I don't want to say all because of generalization, but it just seems like our society right now yeah. with, with professional athletes is that nobody yeah. wants to do a greater good and say, you know, every kid needs this thing. We, you know, I can use my influence. What does it take me three seconds to send out a tweet and say, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Peyton Manning, you know, I would never have gone on this, uh, journey that I went on. I would never go on the field without this new technology. You must get this. It takes him what about five seconds to tweet it out, right? Mm. But he won't do it unless you pay him a uh, hundred million dollars. So to me that's sad and that's a barrier yeah. for for yeah. trying to get uh something like this out there. Yeah. Um, I mean it's a problem with drug studies. It's a problem it's a problem with new, you know, 
fighting the sugar industry. And, you know, we've had talks about that with dietitians on this, uh, on this and, and new exercise, you know, just exercise regimen. So yeah, it's, um, it, it's, uh, I, I can see the mountain you're, 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 yeah. you're still climbing and it's commendable. You're, you're still doing it. So, um, it takes persistence. Yeah. You have to be somebody who just will not give up, which is kind of who I am. <laughs> so, right. Uh, and, I, and I'm making strides. I mean, there's, there's, uh, yep. there's a lot of things I get contacted just out of the blue by people. Cause I mean, especially they, uh, there's, there's, there's no answer to concussions right now. And we don't even know how to treat it really that well. Uh, basically, you know, there's lots of things coming out, but, and I, I think part of it too, is that our, our minds aren't geared towards certain things. Like there's so many ideas out there about measuring concussions and see it kind of, I don't know if you feel this too, Allison, but it comes back to like, I can be world renowned doctor and people can think I'm really smart and I've, I've discovered this. So they, there's a, this thing that people have with this mouth guard with sensors that's not for the kids. That's for the researchers. They want to know how much force, which is a good thing to know, but that doesn't help you when you go out to play football to keep you from getting a concussion. That helps me as a researcher to know how much G force you just had bang against your head so that I can understand, okay, it takes, you know, 50 Newton centimeters to, to get a concussion and if you look at, at the, what they say out there, as far as the range, there's, it's so wide that it, we just don't know uh, how to handle it. It's, you know, 50 Newton centimeters to, to 800. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's another thing is that we just, I don't know. It just takes people who uh, can think outside the box, I guess, I, I you know, to, and, and then stick with it when you know that yep. what, that what you have is an important thing and not give up because really really easy to give up especially when your money runs out sure sure mm -hmm. um really cool um yeah very cool thank you for joining us i think uh you know a message to our listeners is and again we're not experts so we you know we can't validate this so what we what we do here is we're bringing on people with new ideas for people on here that are challenging the old ways and um we'll provide links to dr hutchinson everything his company our youtube links below do your own research test them out. There's nothing wrong with testing and learning and, uh, and go on his website and, and look for the studies and then make up your own mind. But that's, you know, without, without fully endorsing it, we embrace the, you know, the grind, we embrace the consistency, we embrace the challenging of old ways of thinking and that's all we can do here. And then let, let the results speak for themselves. But I, we commend, we commend the grind and the consistency and then the, you know, the results hopefully play out in the market. And that's, that's all you can ask, I think, right? Yeah, the proof is in the pudding. And that's the way I approached it from early on is that you got to wear a mouth guard anyway. Yep. So go out there and wear this mouth guard. Yeah, see what happens. And yep. what happened was people played better. And they didn't get a concussion. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, keep wearing it. <laughs> Every mom and dad out there who's, who's yeah. listening to this. Yeah. You must do this because, yeah, there's uh, been 0.2% of the people who've gotten a concussion, but that's that's so minuscule compared to the chance of of 20%. Sure, sure. So, um, power but, up with Power Plus. Power up with Power <laughs> Plus. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for joining us. It's a really cool story. It's a really niche thing. It's um. It's at least it's tackling an issue like concussions and youth sports and injuries that is um, pertinent to us and our podcast. So we wish you uh, continued success with it and the grind. And we're glad you're making some more in ways with the pro sports. I think, you know, the slow grind is uh, and the consistency is what pays off in the end. So we shall see. Um, but this has been uh, body movement podcast. Dr. Hutchins, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you. You got it. And everyone who you know what to do. Everyone hit like and subscribe down below. We'll be back next week with uh, some some more experts in uh, cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery and talking more about healthcare and taking ownership of your health. So we look forward to having you back. We'll see you next time. Take care. Yeah. See you.